Margie Meacham is a learning consultant who specializes in the application of science and technology to enhance learning and performance. Margie's company, learning to go provides brain-based learning workshops for trainers and instructional designers. Her learning to go podcast has been voted one of the top 10 most popular programs for L and D professionals in the world and her book brain matters, how to help anyone learn anything using neuroscience is a finalist for best indie book on Amazon. Margie is a recipient of the 100 Most Innovative Learning Leaders Award and a frequent speaker at industry events and private keynotes. So tonight, Margie's joining us from her home in Arizona, where she lives with her husband and two small dogs. So Margie, well, take it thank away. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, Joanne, and thank you, everybody who has joined us tonight or is listening to the recording. I am so excited to be with you guys, and the story of LD Philly is an exciting one. It's about learning professionals who have formed their own community and decided to take control of your own professional development and I just think that that is amazing so I'm really happy uh, to be joining you today and because I know you're all learning professionals and I want to tailor what I talk with you about um, somewhat to what you know and what you've experienced so that I don't go over ground you may already be very familiar with, we put together a little bit of a poll, and Joanne is pulling that up now. So if you would just tell us um, what you think, if these are true or false. And it's very interesting as you're answering the poll that the next live event you have is going to cover some of these technologies. So what a great chance I have to uh, be a little bit of a lead-in for that event. Okay, let's see. Have we had, everyone has had almost, uh, all right, looks like everyone has answered all the questions. If I'm right, Joanne, could you please show us um, the answers? And we should be able to doing that. Let me just... Oh, sorry about that, Margie. You should be able to see oh, all of the results that folks have uh, have submitted. Okay. All right. You guys are you guys are a pretty savvy group because I'll tell you, I do this um, a similar talk, and I do this poll all over the world, and um, nobody gets it a hundred percent right, but some people uh, certainly um, have come very close. Every one of these statements is false. So let's go through them quickly and then we'll cover them again during the talk. So augmented reality and virtual reality are uh, two very different things. So virtual reality is everything is created uh, by a combination of software and images and you're watching on a 3D headset and you are feeling as though you're actually touching and feeling and interacting with things in that virtual world, but it's all very self-contained. Augmented reality layers over images and interactive pieces on the real world. So um, uh, you can be looking at a flower and there might be a barcode on it. And when you scan it, that gives you information about the type of flower it is. So augmented reality um, in virtual reality are different and the and as Josh mentioned, you can also have a combined uh, where you're having some of the learning experiences augmented and some of it is virtual. Artificial intelligence, very happy to see that all of you are aware that it's not something that's far, far away. We're going to spend a lot of tonight talking about how artificial intelligence is already changing the way we learn and giving us some really interesting things that we can do to help people learn. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are not the same things and I'll talk about and they're often mixed in the media. They're often used as more or less the same thing and that that 
is not technically correct and it's something that's going to be important for you but most of you got that one right so that's great learning management systems have gone through a major change in the last few years and will continue to do so because they're finally pulling in some of these exciting technologies and finally virtual reality has become surprisingly affordable in the last few years and all of you got that right it's not true that it's too expensive for the average organization to dip their toe into and that's the real key is getting started in a reasonable affordable way that's going to set you up for success so great all right so now that we've taken a look at the poll let's go ahead and switch over to what I want to talk about today and you know making predictions can be a pretty tricky thing so let's take a look before I make some predictions about where learning technology is headed. Let's take a look at some other predictions that you may or may not be familiar with. How about this one? When television first came out, Daryl Zanuck, who was at the time leading one of the biggest uh, movie companies, possibly because he had a bit of an ax to grind, he said, ah, oh, TV, people will get tired of it after six months. When the iPhone first came out, Steve Ballmer said, nah, it'll never get any significant market share. When the Beatles came out, one of the biggest recording companies refused to sign them because after all, guitar music was on the way out. And of course, we all remember this prediction from last year. So, why do we do it? Why do we keep making predictions when so often we fall flat on our face? Well, the fact is that as human beings, we're actually wired to do that. Your brain is constantly making predictions. As soon as you decided to come tonight or to listen to this recording, you started imagining how this webinar might be. You've attended the other types of events, you've, um, you've seen other speakers, you've seen similar topics, and you started to predict either a pleasurable, interesting experience or maybe one um, that you didn't like. And you do that for one important reason. Your brain is hardwired to help you survive. That's the only reason we do anything we do inside our brains is because at some point in our history as a species, that behavior helped us stay alive. So the reason we predict, the reason we love to play at that is because it's a survival skill. It's how we can guess, hopefully accurately most of the time, whether that rustle of leaves in the bushes is a saber-toothed tiger or tonight's dinner. Anticipate. Absolutely, Joanne. That's what it's all about. That's what prediction is. And you know, your learners are doing the same thing. So they're either predicting a really exciting, engaging, pleasurable experience or something less than that. So the more we can build something new and engaging and pull in these new technologies, if it shakes up and gives them something unexpected, we have a much better chance at getting their attention. And the truth is that these technologies are already out there. So when I'm predicting the future of learning, I don't have to look very far. The self-driving cars, uh, the smart home where everything is connected to the internet, Alexa and other personal assistants that are in the homes that can interact with you and provide at least limited artificial intelligence in the sense that they learn your preferences and they get better at meeting your needs the more you interact with them. So we've all heard about all of these things. And you've probably also heard that attention spans are changing. So there's a very famous study, Microsoft does it every few years and in 2000 the average attention span of a human being was 12 seconds but just last year it was down to eight seconds where the goldfish is still in there at nine so why do you think that's happening what would be making our attention span so much shorter
Yeah, absolutely. Smartphones, the pace of information, the multiple sources, all of those things, the digital world we live in, the world that we created. And we have to bounce back and forth all day long. And it's exhausting because your brain really wasn't built for that. Your brain was built for slower modes of operation, but it's being forced to move at a quicker pace and to bounce around and to go on and on to newer and newer pieces of information. I know you guys are probably a lot like me. I start the day and the first thing I do is get online. And before I know it, by the end of the day, I might have 20 windows open. And some of those things I never get back to. I know that's crazy and I know that's not good for me, but that's kind of how our days go, right? But there's really nothing wrong with having our attention span diminish because it's in response to the fact that our world has changed. That means we're still evolving. Species that stop evolving, they aren't around anymore. The dinosaurs are a good example. And you know that goldfish, their world is not as complex as ours, so they don't have a lot to pay attention to. And so if they get mesmerized by something and stare at it for nine seconds, they're probably still going to be safe. Whereas a human being in today's world, if you stare at something that long, you're going to miss all kinds of potentially important stuff. You're also going to probably see a lot of distraction. So one of the things we have to consider as learning professionals is how do we operate? How do we still deliver effective learning experiences uh, to take a phrase from one of your upcoming events, how do we build the training people want when we know that they're not going to be able to pay attention for very long, that they're going to hopefully come back to what we're doing, but they're not going to stay focused on it. I know right now as a presenter that in the course of what I've said so far, each of you has paid attention and then jumped off and come back multiple times. You can't help it. Even if you're not aware you're doing it, your brain is scanning your environment to make sure it's still safe. You might be checking an email. There might be a noise outside. You might shift in your seat to get a little more comfortable. You might have to adjust your headphones or have some other issue going on. And so I have to be aware that to get your attention and maintain it does not mean I have 100% focus all the time. What it means is I have this scattered, fragmented attention that adds up like the pieces of a puzzle to the story I want to tell by the end. And so one way to be effective in delivering that story is to use the same technology that's yanking at our attention. Does that make sense so far, guys? Okay, great. And absolutely be ready to throw out questions as we go. So here's a couple of examples of what's happening already. In Japan, they have a shortage of teachers. Not surprisingly, we have a similar, not quite a severe shortage here in the United States. I think most of us tonight are from the United States. So, but in Japan, they took a different approach. Any time that they need a substitute teacher, they bring out an artificial intelligence robot that interacts with the children and challenges them with their lessons and asks questions and responds to their questions. And they build it to be very child friendly. So you can see these children are smiling. They're not creeped out. The um, inventors were very careful not to give the robot a name because they didn't want to encourage people to over uh, overly connect with it as though it were a human being. They wanted to keep that bright line. So what do you think is the first thing the children did when they started interacting with the robot? They gave it a name. Yeah, they gave it a cute name. Um, I'm not very good at pronouncing it in Japanese. Um, we do the same thing. A lot of people name their automobiles um, or they believe that their computers, male or female, 
Um, they will talk about it as though it is having a good day or a bad day or is in a mood or is angry with us. Um, we anthropomorphize our technology because we relate to it as though it is a human being. Now they've watched people's brains and when we relate to a screen, we light up in the same places that we light up when we talk to a person. So our brain has made the adjustment now. It's no longer, and, and this is why it becomes so effortless for us to live these digital lives, for us to do what we're doing right now, because we can connect. We don't have to keep reminding us ourselves that there are people on the other end of this connection. We know that. We, we've done it before. We recognize it. And we can look at a screen and understand that we are actually interacting with people. Now, a really interesting thing happened last year in the University of Georgia. And that is that in a computer programming class, the professor decided that instead of a human being as the teacher's assistant to help the students with their homework, answer questions, that kind of thing, he would write an artificial intelligence program and let it learn by responding to the teachers, to the student, rather, to the emails that it got throughout the year and see how smart it could become and see how many people would recognize that he actually was using an artificial intelligence. Now, it probably should have been a tip off that he named his teaching assistant Jill Watson after the famous IBM machine that won Jeopardy a few years ago, but nobody picked up on that. I thought it was kind of clever. So the whole term goes by. At first, the students complained that Jill wasn't a very good teaching assistant, but nobody ever thought that she wasn't a human being. And so at the end, when he told them that it was, uh, it was quite a revelation and I would think an inspiration to these students who are looking at a career in exactly what he was doing, building an artificial intelligence. So it's already, artificial intelligence is already in use in learning, whether you are using it or not. It's no longer a future. The future is already here. It's just a matter of us catching up to it if that makes sense. So one of the things I think we're all going to see in the near future is artificial intelligence that can take care of some of the interaction with learners and be sort of a learning coach, for example. You've all probably interacted with something called a chatbot, whether you know it or not. So you get on a website and a little box pops out and says, hey, you got any questions? Can I help you? And you start typing away. Yeah, sometimes those are human beings, but many, many times they are not. And truly, you can't tell the difference, nor do you particularly care. I will often choose that live chat as opposed to a phone call because I feel the communication is far more efficient and I get more help. Ah, I see Joanne feels the same way I do. And um, why not? have some kind of learning coach, you've got a huge LMS with tons of stuff in there. What if a little box popped up and said, what do you want to learn today? And people could type as opposed to be searching. They could just be typing an actual conversation with a program that understands how to answer those questions and direct people in a better way. As a matter of fact, that that's a I think a very simple kind of thing to do. I'm building a chatbot right now. Um, so if anybody is interested in exploring that, there's a it's it's really fairly simple to do, and you can get free materials to do that from IBM and other places. But IBM um, gives you access to the code and gives you little templates, so it's really not too hard. And then it starts to learn. The more students interact with it, the better it's going to get at making recommendations. Now, we talked about virtual reality for training, and you guys were already way ahead of me. You know it's already being used. It's being used to train surgeons so they can practice um, a procedure over and over and over again on an extremely lifelike um, patient. And mistakes have extremely lifelike 
consequences and um, great jobs are readily evident. Uh, Starbucks has a virtual reality store where people practice making all kinds of lattes and other fancy coffee drinks. And they interact with virtual customers and find out uh, what happens when they're rude to a customer or slow in responding. And these are just a couple of quick examples, but it is also true that the military has been using virtual reality for combat training for quite a while. We've also recently discovered that it's exceptionally good with helping with PTSD treatment. And so it can help someone who has been through a traumatic experience get past it by putting them into that situation again and helping them cope and uh, process what happened to them. And of course, we're all experienced with YouTube. Just the other day, I fixed my coffee maker because um, as you get to know me, you're going to realize that uh, my coffee maker not working in the morning is a major crisis. And I had right there, I had a little user manual printed in five different languages. And I had my computer. And of course, what did I do? I jumped on YouTube. I found a video and 30 seconds later I was brewing coffee again. So our learners are already self-serve. They're already interacting with virtual realities in gaming sites uh, for their personal entertainment. Maybe they work somewhere else. So again, when I talk about the future of learning, it may be the future for you and your learners, but it's already here. And this is some, uh, some of the things that we have to consider as we get ready to implement these things. Now, I think they sound far more in, uh, intimidating than they are because generally speaking, these technologies don't require you to be a data scientist or a computer programmer. You simply have to be willing to experiment. So let's talk about how all these technologies sort of um, work together to bring about the learning of the future. Big data, who can tell me what your sense of big data is? There isn't any right or wrong answer. Um, but when you hear that term or, or see it up there on the slide, what, do, what does that mean to you? Oh, I've got a bunch of answers. Great. That's certainly a great example, Joanne. Um, large companies that have lots of information about their customers and they use it, right, to maybe identify new opportunities, figure out how to make the service better. And it's certainly analytics on a large scale. And, and the first uses, as a lot of these things are, the first uses were in marketing. And when you think about it, as learning professionals, we're really in marketing too, right? Because we have to have people motivated in order to learn. So what big data can do is it can tell you about learner behavior. It can tell you about the choices they make. It can tell you where they click on a screen. It can tell you how they perform. They can uh, take performance reviews and identify trends and tell you where people actually need their training. Now, the interesting thing is we all are saying you need big companies because you need tons and tons of information. The truth is, though, you can also do, take that same approach on a smaller scale as long as you know how to ask the right questions and extract the right information from your data. So it doesn't necessarily have to be as a, a Fortune 100 company to employ big data. You do need a little bit of help to have the data collected. If you do surveys, for example, if you have an LMS, there's a very good chance you have some data that you're not tapping into right now that could be used to give you some insights. Big data is also a way to teach artificial intelligence how to get better. So for example, Google took uh, all their images and fed it into their artificial intelligence to make it better at recognizing 
what an image really is. So if I have a picture of a mountain lion and someone's searching for cat, will mountain lion come up? Will um, a cartoon like Hello Kitty come up? And big data is a part of that. So absolutely, an LMS run um, can give you the learner analytics to identify what the students really need to know, how they're using the LMS, where are they having trouble, um, what are they, what features are they not using that maybe they should be. And all of that is often just kind of sitting there and not being fully used. Now let's talk about machine learning. Machine learning is connected to artificial intelligence. It's the process of creating an intelligence. Machine learning is really that term machine. It's usually not a robot like I'm showing you guys here. It's usually a program like that chat bot. So machine learning is the same process we humans go through. It's trial and error and feedback. And so the program gets better and better the more it's used, the more people interact with that. And yes, Matt, in your um, in answer to your question, you guys are coming up with some great questions. Uh, depending on the LMS, if you have a modern LMS, if it's been purchased fairly recently, or you have been updating it as you go and buying some of the newly available modules, then you should be able to pull all that information um, within a learning experience. Um, and it would be a whole different class to talk about how you would leverage your LMS, but that's certainly, um, you're, you guys are all thinking along the right lines. Take a look at what you've already got, and are you fully using the information you have? And if you are going to dip your toe into artificial intelligence, the most important thing you can do is release it before you think it's perfect, because that's the only way it's going to learn. Now, virtual reality, is anybody, since all of you got that question right, is anybody working with virtual reality right now? Oh, I have multiple attendees typing. Hannah used to. Okay, Hannah, could you tell us a little bit about how you uh, used virtual reality? Ah, okay. So someone had said earlier that virtual reality is often used in marketing and that it's easy to make the business case for something like that. And and virtual reality is sort of like creating a movie. It's a it's an experience and often an entertaining one and so storyboards are a big part of that and um, it uh, it's sort of e-learning on steroids or it certainly can be. Um, and, and building out those scenarios. So thank you for sharing that. And I would encourage everybody, if you, you, you have a resource right here in LD Philly, um, who can probably answer some of your questions if you're curious about how to get that started. Um, I'm also going to share some uh, resources at the end, and you guys will be able to get the slides from today. So I've provided some links as well. Um, and one of them happens to be um, how to get started in virtual reality. Now, miniaturization, the reason I put that one up there is we often don't think about it, but the reason that we can do all these things and do them in a way that's not as clunky as before is because the electronics keep getting smaller and smaller. So a virtual reality headset used to be so massive, it, it really was almost unwearable. And they've gotten much more streamlined. And in fact, um, as you've probably seen, there are models out there that um, will convert a smartphone into a virtual reality headset and uh, really low cost and they work, uh, they work really well. The other thing that miniaturization lets us do is get into brain PC interfaces. And we're not talking about the future here. Um, or if you, I don't know if we have any Star Trek fans um, uh, with the Borg, um, who are the kind of classic scary 
half human, half machine. Um, I'm a Star Trek fan. I'm a um, Doctor Who fan. I'm a technology fan. So um, I, every once in a while, it sneaks in to my uh, to my talks. Yes. And you know what, Josh, resistance is kind of futile. It makes no sense for us to get creeped out or worried or resist these technologies because they're already here and they're only going to expand. That's the history of technology. So there are brain PC interfaces today that are doing wonderful things for people who have problems. For example, the opening of the World Cup soccer featured a young boy. Unfortunately, those of us watching it on TV in America, most of us were not given the gift of watching it because I think we were running a commercial. A young boy who's been paralyzed uh, for a long time was given a PC interface so that he could make the first kick. So that he could send a signal from his brain through that interface back into his leg and move his leg for the first time. And it's a just a stunning moment. Uh, so there's a lot of hope for people who need these kind of interfaces. But think about what it will mean for learning because the next step after it's used for medical purposes is going to be to use it for more mainstream things. So, uh, and in fact, Google attempted to do this with Google Glass a few years ago. They didn't get it quite right. People didn't really enjoy it. Uh, but we won't have to remember as much. We won't have to type as much. We're going to be able to think about something and choose to pull it up and display it to ourselves. And in fact, there are alpha versions of these interfaces that are working right now. And I have to admit that it's if I picture myself using one of those things, I still get a little nervous, but it's going to happen. And that's going to make eventually the way we teach people our learning profession may be different. We may, in fact, be more about figuring out how to use these technologies then we are designing classes. And I think it's going to happen fairly soon. This is also part of what happens with the neural networks and with the chatbots, which we've already sort of talked about. So machine learning is computers programmed to program themselves. So once they're set up, you don't have to keep. So in the old fashioned approach of programming is you have to tell the program everything it's going to do, like those branching scenarios that Hannah was talking about. So if you think about taking, say, a virtual reality technology and merging it with machine learning, you could now have an artificial intelligence that creates the scenarios based on the way the learners are interacting. So this is going to be the next stage. You're going to see multiple technologies working together in ways that we're not right now. The artificial intelligence is going to interact to help learners. It might be, for example, um, a leadership coach. It might become a learning buddy. Uh, remember those children who named their robot? It's also going to be something that might actually advance us as human beings. Because if we have these artificial intelligences helping us learn faster, that's going to change our brains. And I don't just mean that metaphorically. I mean that figuratively. And it's certainly OK, Joanne, to um, cross your fingers. Because it's really up to us to do this well and to do this in a way that is safe and equitable. And here's my concern as learning professionals. If we are not driving this, the people driving these technologies are more than likely going to be people who are selling something, which that's, hey, everyone has to make a living. But we as learning professionals have a responsibility to be educated about these technologies and to be making sure they're being used to advance the human race, to, to make life better for us, to help people do things better, to give them insights and to free up their time. And I am a bit concerned that if we don't do that, who knows what direction some things would go in. So I don't mean to give you guys nightmares tonight, 
but I do believe very strongly that we have an important role to play and that so far we're kind of lagging behind. You know, that's a great uh, question, Ron, and I do think that in if you asked most teachers and college professors, they would be a little concerned. And you know what, I can go back to when the uh, handheld calculator first came out. And I remember when it was a fairly big device and the concern that students weren't really learning math because now they could have a function performed for them by pushing a button. Um, and that was a big concern. What It took a while for educators to realize that what this did was free up the student to focus on thinking like a mathematician to going into the modeling and the underlying logic behind the function rather than simply memorizing how to perform the function. And so I hope that makes sense. I think that that is what artificial intelligence can do for us. But I agree with you, not everyone sees it that way. Because really where I think we're headed is an augmented human being. So it's not just augmented reality, it's us that's going to be augmented. And I am not talking, uh, you know, hundreds of years from now. I'm talking in our lifetimes. I am uh, seeing it. I am already seeing the beta models. So how will that change the way we work, the way you guys work? One of the things you have to do is you have to get smarter about these technologies that are already here, start using them, start thinking about how does this help the learner? Figure out if there is a nonlinear, and by that I mean don't just think about one, just don't just say I'm going to implement virtual reality, but how does that work with my LMS? What does that mean for testing? Is there an interface? How will they interface with it? Who's going to program it? Could we have a chatbot in the virtual reality experience that helps people, that people can interact with, that also makes the virtual reality better. And start thinking of playing a little what if yourself. And in fact, that's what we're going to do right now before we finish. So let me start with, um, I'm sorry, I kind of jumped ahead, uh, but now I'm where I want to be. Let me uh, catch my breath for a minute because I've thrown a lot at you. Do you guys have any questions before I give you a little activity? And while you're thinking of your questions, I also want to point out that um, Joanne has put up the slides there um, uh, on your screen over there. So you can actually download my slides. And uh, it is the actual PowerPoint, not a PDF. I strongly believe that everyone should take my slides and use them however you want. So make your own presentations out of them. If you like an image, they're all license free, so they'd be license free to you. Um, and if you want to use this presentation with someone else or build off it, feel free to do that. There's no uh, protection to the slides whatsoever. So if you don't have any questions, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make you guys all futurists. I want you to think about your job and your jobs. Each of you probably has a little bit different job, but think about what you do. And I want you to describe one thing that you think you will probably start doing in the next five years that you're not doing now based on some of these future of learning technologies that I've highlighted today. And just type it there in the chat window. Let me see if I have a slide on that. Yes. So predict something about you specifically and your role as a learning professional. Go ahead, take a minute, give it some thought. Oh, augmented reality built into participant guides. So tell me a little bit more about that, Josh. How do you see that working? I think you might have a business idea there.
I think we could all just go work for Josh. Yeah, use your smartphone instead of social media. Make printed books interactive. And you know, to a small extent, they are right now. Um, uh, most online universities, and I design courses for a lot of them, use an interactive PDF as the textbook, which allows the learner to bookmark and highlight, and it will pop up questions and little quizzes and links to other parts of the book. So um, to a certain extent, they do that now. But with augmented reality, just think um, they could have a physical book that has all kinds of hidden wonders in it that when you touch it at a certain place, you scan it at a certain place, uh, videos play and um, other cool things, sites open up, other cool things happen. Susan is thinking about using virtual and or augmented reality to help people interact with their residents. Um, so that, you know, similar to surgeons, you know, because now we're talking about uh, treating the mind um, as opposed to the body. Um, yeah, having a, um, a way to interact over and over again with different scenarios so that they become highly skilled uh, in, in, the, uh, in ways before they are in front of a patient so that they are confident and skilled at doing that. And Ron would like to put the student into a virtual reality just like Starbucks is doing. Uh, you know, I design a lot of e-learning. I've designed a lot of it in my day and I'm sure you guys have too. And it certainly adds value to give people a hands-on experience. However, these realities take all that to such a new level. And what happens when you are interacting with a, whether it's a classic e-learning and you're doing some little click and drag activity or you're in a deep virtual reality experience, your brain is learning. And what that means is that you are rewiring the cells in your brain. They are physically disconnecting and reconnecting in new ways. And we can watch this happen. And the more stimulation, the more senses that are involved, the greater the rewiring, the greater the learning. And so that's why these technologies create such a more powerful learning experience. And so um, Hannah is jumping ahead to looking at a fourth reality, a new reality. I think you're absolutely right, Hannah. I think our idea, we, we talk right now, I did it myself. I talked about, quote, in the real world. Um, as though it, that's still a thing, as though there's still a separation from our digital lives and our so-called real lives. However, I think we are headed to a point where the, that distinction is meaningless, where we are going to live in a blended world that parts of it are digital and parts of it are, um, are not, and parts are combined. And that means it's going to change our learning experience because we as human beings are changing and therefore learning has to change with it or we will stop being relevant and i don't believe that's going to happen for a minute so thank you guys for those predictions and those of you listening to the recording i encourage you to do the same thing play a little what if and see if you can come up with your own creative idea about something new you're going to see in the next five years based on at least one of these realities. And I have had a terrific time with you guys today. I know that we are going to need to allow a little bit of time for wrap up and I want to be here for your questions. So let me get a couple little logistics out of the way. If you would like to get our brain and learning um, newsletter where I talk about this stuff all the time, it's free. You can text 22828 or uh, you can write me and I'm about to give you my email address and other stuff. Um, let's stay in touch. I've really enjoyed talking with you guys. We're all fellow learning professionals and um, I answer my email address personally. I'm you know, not too big or busy to do that. So if you get a question, here's what's gonna happen. Here's how your brain works. You are going to um, think of a question after this webinar, probably not until tomorrow, because 
while you sleep, your brain reorganizes everything that happened in the day, including this webinar. And so then I'm going to be gone. So that's why I want you to know how to get in touch with me. You can send me an email. You can tweet to me at Margie Meacham on Twitter, or you can go to my website and you can look and see if I may have already posted and answered your question in one of the blog posts or in one of my podcasts. But definitely, let's connect. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. I hope I hear from you a lot, and I hope I hear from the rest of you. Now, here are some resources I recommend, and if you download the slides, you will have the links. Notice that um, there's articles on the artificial intelligence uh, assistance, the future of business with artificial intelligence. This third one here, IBM Watson for Educators, that, is, uh, that tells you how to get started building your own chatbot for education. Uh, the next one is about that smart LMS. So several of you were interested in pulling more data off your LMS. You need to have what I call a modern LMS uh, in order to do that. Um, where do we already have artificial intelligence? You might not even know. And then where are the next disruptions coming in training and education? So I recommend those uh, resources. If you guys find some more, please let me know. I would be very happy to um, share them and add them uh, to a future presentation that I'm sure you're going to make somewhere. So let me ask you guys, um, do you have any more questions or comments uh, before I throw it back over to Josh for a wrap up? I see some coming in, so I'm happy to just wait. While we're waiting for... Susan, I think you didn't get oh, sorry, your Margie. thing. I was just going to say, yeah, while we're waiting for people to uh, type in the uh, their questions, I wanted to uh, definitely take the opportunity to thank you for a very uh, entertaining and educational presentation this evening. And uh, I, I was uh, also taking a quick look at your uh, Twitter when... Uh, you post that up there and uh, any Twitter feed that uh, starts with an article about Homer Simpson and learning uh, is uh, good for me. So I, I appreciate that. I, I'd <laughs> actually seen that article before and I think I wrote a blog in, in, in response to some of that at one point too. It's a interesting article and uh, kind of goes along with uh, some of the stuff we're talking about. So uh, I encourage all of you to take a peek at uh, all those ways to connect. I just signed up for the newsletter as well and looking forward to uh, seeing uh, that you're continuing updates. And again, I, 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 appre I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to uh, join us and support the, uh, our organization as well. Uh, so now, now that I've uh, uh, spoken for a moment here, see if anybody uh, has had an opportunity to uh, fill in with uh, some questions. Well, thank you, Josh, and I look forward to seeing you on my mailing list. And if you guys uh, are wondering what we're talking about, the Homer Simpson effect is, is a real thing that neuroscientists talk about. So you can read about that and some other things in my newsletter and on my Twitter feed. And I think to your point, we're, we're, our, our, we've got about I was say, our brains are buzzing. Yeah. We'll probably, uh, as I collect my thoughts in my sleep tonight, come up with things mm -hmm. to ask. So... Uh, Joanne, just threw a reminder in here, too, that the uh, presentation is available to download. And uh, if we don't get any other questions, I think, uh, again, I'll uh, thank you uh, for this marvelous presentation and looking forward to uh, staying in touch. Great, absolutely. And I'd love to come back, guys. I have all kinds of things I can talk about. So uh, we'll do this again sometime. So thank you, everybody, again, for spending time with me. And go ahead and let those uh, neurons uh, coalesce. And if you have any other questions, get in touch and let me know.